Hello everyone, thanks for joining me today for Bible study. Today we will once again be learning about a hero of the faith, through whom our God worked to bring about his will. Let's begin with prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather, even though it is not yet in person. We know that you are at work through your word, no matter how we meet. Help us to be patient in this ever-changing world, and open our minds to your word today. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. See if you can figure out today's hero of the faith. He lived as an ordinary fisherman until he was called to be a different kind of fisherman. Jesus himself called him to be a fisher of men. He followed Jesus for three years as Jesus taught about God, explained the scriptures, and showed that he himself was full of the authority of God, and that he had power. This hero of the faith saw, witnessed water turned into wine, the sick healed miraculously, the lame walk, and spirits cast out at his command. This is the power of Jesus. And this hero of the faith believed his teaching. One time, Jesus asked this hero of the faith who he thought he was, and he responded, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus gave him a new name, Petros, Peter, which means rock. Peter is today's hero of the faith. I'm sure you've heard of Peter. Peter can often be seen with such an enthusiastic faith as he followed Jesus, but along with that enthusiasm, we also see Peter's sin, Peter's sinful humanity and his failures. Sometimes he would get so excited that he would speak and act without thinking it through. Sometimes he would jump to conclusions. Well, here's one example that comes to my mind. When he sees Jesus walking on the water and fully believing who he followed, he followed the Son of God, he asked if he too could walk on water. He wanted to walk to Jesus. And that's enthusiasm. Sure enough, Jesus invites him to go out onto the water, and he's able to. That's because Jesus has authority. But then Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus, and he sinks. He relied on the Lord to save him. Another moment that comes to mind about Peter is the day Jesus was taken into custody. He was arrested. Peter tried to protect him. It was no use, though. Jesus healed the man that Peter harmed that day, and then he willingly went off to trial. See, there was a time and a place for Jesus to die, even though it wasn't deserved. Jesus died for Peter. He died for those who arrested him, he died for those who betrayed him, and he died for the world. But as Peter followed Jesus off to trial, he denied him three times. He lied over and over again, denying his Savior. It was that Sunday morning when the women came from Jesus' empty tomb and declared that Jesus had arisen, that Peter also found the tomb empty. And the Lord appeared to him and to the others, and spoke to him, arisen, and he forgave Peter for denying him. And though Jesus ascended, he left Peter and the others with the Spirit, and God continued working through them and with them. Peter's faith was a gift, a gift of the Holy Spirit from God, who was at work taking that faith with such enthusiasm to people who needed to hear it. Let's just begin reading our passage today. We're continuing in the book of Acts. We're now in chapter 10. Last week, we read chapter 8 as we learned more about Philip and the Lord's work through him. And in chapter 9, I invited you to read that. We see a drastic turn in the church as Saul is changed from persecutor of the church to advocate of the church, advocate of the Lord. The Lord now works through this man who once sought after the destruction of the church. And now, in chapter 10, we will hear about the continued work of the Lord through Peter in Acts chapter 10. So let's read verses 1 through 8. 
At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in, come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants, and a devout soldier from among those who attended him, and having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. All right, let's take a look at this text. By this time, Jesus has already ascended. Pentecost has happened. The Great Commission has been spoken by Jesus, that the church would be making disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching. And that is truly and fully the case. And yet, perhaps sometimes these Christians don't yet fully understand what that ministry to the nations will practically look like because it won't always look like it did in the past. The covenant has changed. Salvation is in Christ. The recipients have widened in the sense that it's now not just for one nation, but for all nations. And now through sinful people, the Spirit carries the true word of God out. We will see that tension, that change in Peter today. We start in chapter 10 by hearing about a man named Cornelius. Cornelius is not yet a follower of Jesus. He's called a devout man, a man who feared God. Specifically, he was a Gentile, a non-Hebrew, who took interest in Judaism. He's kind of adopted Judaism in practice as his religion, but not every aspect of it. But he's, in doubt in, he's devout in that endeavor. He gave alms generously, he prayed continually, and this is the case for himself and also for his whole family. All of this is very important to notice as we read, because Jesus instructed his disciples to go out to Jew and to Greek, to Hebrew and to non-Hebrew, to those who worship in the synagogue and to those who do not worship at all. And here we have a Gentile who is devout as he follows God, the gospel is for the Jew first and then to the Greek. And many who hear the gospel will already have some understanding of the Old Testament, like this man Cornelius. Some were devout Jews, some were Hebrews, and many knew their Old Testament scriptures. And with that background in mind, we will see the gospel go out to those people, today specifically to Cornelius and to his family. As someone who devoted his life and his household to worship, he knew the Old Testament. And so he was fertile soil to receive the seed of the gospel message. So this man Cornelius is visited by an angel of God. And remember, the word angel can also mean messenger. So an angel or a messenger of God appears to Cornelius and speaks to him. And no surprise, as we often see, Cornelius is afraid. He immediately fears, as we so often hear in response to an angel. There's something terrifying, something very different about an angel of God appearing to a sinful person. And Cornelius then immediately reacts. He says, well, what is it, Lord? Though it is an angel of the Lord coming to him, a messenger of the Lord, he recognizes that it is the Lord himself who is speaking to him. It is the Lord's message being sent through this messenger of God. And so this devout man hears this message as the very word of God coming to him specifically. And his reaction is to share that message from the angel of God with two of his servants, and even with a soldier also who is called devout. When Cornelius devoutly follows God, it's not something he does alone. It's his family, it's his servants, it's everyone around him. 
And so Cornelius then relays that message that he's received, that he clearly received, as the text says, that the Lord desires that he will interact with the man called Simon, Peter, the rock. So off to Joppa, the men go, they're sent. Let's go ahead and read verses 9 through 17. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. It's a little strange at first glance. We hear about Cornelius, the, the men are sent to find Simon Peter, and then we're given this weird detail about a trance of Peter, a vision that he receives. So now both of these men have received a miraculous visitation of their God through an angel, through a trance, as they are being prepared to be brought together. The angel of the Lord sends Cornelius by a dream to Peter, sends these men, uh, a man who will speak the word of God, something that Cornelius is lacking. He, he may know the Old Testament, but he's missing what has happened in Jesus Christ. And so we're still being set up for that end result, but until we get there, in the meantime, we have Peter's perplexing vision we see that something has changed, something that may be hard for Peter at first. Do you remember that enthusiastic faith of Peter that we see so often? I think we see it once more in this vision in a way. He sees something happen and immediately spits out his gut reaction, his first thought. He was hungry at the sixth hour, about noon, and he was praying on the housetop. He needed something to eat, and then perhaps when he is most vulnerable, when it comes to those convictions that he has about kosher laws, he sees a great sheep descending from the heavens, being let down to the earth. A strange imagery, a sheet being lowered. That's really peculiar. And perhaps we don't fully understand what's going on with this sheet, but we see what's happening on it, and the point being made and delivered to Peter. That sheet being lowered from the heavens contained all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. God is showing in his vision that something has changed. Peter has shown that animals that were once called unclean, off-limits, not to be eaten, are maybe not unclean anymore. There were many things declared unclean by God, but the, thing has, the time has come when that regulation has changed. Because he says, rise, Peter, kill and eat those animals. Now, Peter was not a vegetarian. He clearly ate meat. But according to ceremonial law and ceremonial rel regulations, he did not eat anything declared unclean. Peter followed that law faithfully. It was what he knew. And so this isn't just something he would avoid or prefer not to consume. It would have been quite repulsive for him. He was raised in this practice. But God now declares what was once unclean, perfectly fine for God's people to consume. Consuming something unclean once marked someone as part of an outside nation, someone who didn't follow the one true God, because it was something forbidden.
but now it is no longer forbidden, and so that distinction is not made. Our text says, what God has made clean, do not call common. And not only is God saying that Peter may consume what was once unclean, he's actually declaring that he should. Do it, Peter. For what was once called unclean has now been called clean by God. The laws and the regulations God declares for his people are his own to declare. They are dependent on his command. And that means that if God wills to change those regulations, he may. So he shows this three times to Peter in this vision, so that there's absolutely no mistaking. This, without a doubt, is God's will being relayed clearly to Peter. Now we will see that as this vision occurs for Peter, the men sent by Cornelius arrive. So these events are related, they're not separate. Let's continue reading and see what happens in verse 17 through 22. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. The visions we've heard about of both Cornelius and Peter are related God is doing something through each of these people, specifically through Peter for Cornelius and those in Cornelius' close circle, his relations. These men who are sent are like Cornelius. They pray, they're devout, that's all good. There's fertile ground here once again. But in a way, they're kind of left out from everything, like Cornelius. See, on the one hand, though they are interested in Judaism, they are not pure Hebrews. They have not been born into the covenant. They are not circumcised. So though they have interest in Judaism, though they have some practice, they are not full-fledged converts. At the same time, though they are Gentiles, they are also left out in a way on this end, because they do not follow the Lord Jesus. And yet, we hear in these visions about something that was once declared unclean that is now declared clean. And truthfully, it, it is about food. It's about the kosher laws that Peter is hesitant to give up. But it's not only about those kosher laws. There's much more to it. It's about people in this case. It's about the Great Commission and Pentecost and the opening up of the door of salvation, not only for the Jew, but for Gentiles and for everyone. And so these men approach Peter, who has just seen this strange, confronting vision, and they, who were told by Cornelius the message of the angel, the messenger of God, they now take that message and themselves deliver it to Peter, a man of God devout as he follows the one true God, through Jesus. And he will have, have a clear message to deliver to them, so that they and their families, and Cornelius and his family, would know the truth about the salvation of the nations. Let's keep on reading. This is a larger section in verses 23 through 48. We are going to see Cornelius now come to Peter, and Peter's reaction verses 23 through 48. So he invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. 
And as he talked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked then why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Send, therefore, to Joppa, and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon a Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers fell from among the circumcised, who had come with Peter, were amazed, because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. So Peter clearly sees that something more is going on. After just himself seeing such a peculiar vision, these men come to him and talk about a vision that came to their master Cornelius. This is no coincidence. And so he invites them in to join him, and he's told that the Spirit sent them. Peter traveled with them to Caesarea to go to Cornelius, and Cornelius reacts greatly when seeing Peter. After all, when an angel of God comes to you and tells you to send out for someone, when they come, that's an important, a significant moment. And so he bows down and worships, to which Peter corrects him and says, I'm a man, don't worship me. That's not why I'm here. And Peter goes on, he shows us that he understood the vision of God. He understood that while it certainly had ramifications about food and purity laws, it was not only about what food he could eat. It's about how God declares the truth. If God declares something unclean, it is unclean. If God declares something clean, it is clean without a doubt, full stop. That's the case for ceremonial laws. And it's the case for people. And it's true even for the nations of the world, as now it is declared and true that they too are to hear the gospel. He says, I know who you are. It's no secret of your religious practices or our differences. He knows it. And yet, he says, I'm not here to write you off or to declare you unclean or unworthy of the truth. Why? Because God has revealed that what he has called clean, a necessity, is to be treated as such. That means if he declares that the word is to go out to the nations, 
even to these God-fearing, devout worshipers who are neither Hebrew nor Gentile Christian, then that's what's supposed to happen. Cornelius then begins to explain why he sent for Peter, and he recalls exactly what was delivered to him, the message of the angel of God that was then passed on through the men sent by Cornelius, which now once again is delivered again directly to Peter, as God has brought them together. And God has brought them together for what purpose but for them to hear the word of God? Cornelius needs the word, and that's something that Peter can deliver. He has a message too. It's something called not off limits, but necessary. It's necessary that Peter speaks these words, for God himself has declared that to be his will. And who is any creature to call common what God has called clean, or good, or righteous, or necessary? Our text says, Peter opened his mouth, and what did he declare? He proclaimed exactly what Cornelius needed to hear, the word. Because though he knew the Old Testament, he was missing the New Covenant. Peter says, God shows no, par no partiality, but in every nation, not just some nations, not one nation, but every nation, anyone who fears him is acceptable to him. To fear God is to acknowledge that he is the creator, the almighty Lord over all of creation. Fearing God indicates a relationship with God, how we relate as creatures to the creator of the universe. We acknowledge his power. We acknowledge his righteous ability to condemn us to eternal damnation as punishment for sin. But it's not only that. It doesn't end there. We also acknowledge his gracious acts to redeem us despite the condemnation of the law, especially in Christ, and that's what Peter declares. So Peter declares to Cornelius and the others the true work of God through Jesus. The whole ministry and mission of God in the life death, and resurrection, and ascension of the Christ. And now the role of the church is to proclaim that work and word of God for all the nations for whom it took place, even for them. And in that moment, those who heard the word, even the Gentiles, were filled with the Holy Spirit. It was an amazing sight for all, even for those who had traveled with Peter, those Christians. And as we saw last week, the logical next step is their baptism. As those who have been brought in, declared righteous, devout, as those who follow the Lord Jesus and know the true working of God in their midst, they are baptized. The word of God has brought about the will of God. It's accomplished that. We read these events, both seeing the larger ramification of these truths, that, that God is opening up salvation for the Gentiles and bringing about the work of the church. But we don't only see a wide view, the, the almost theoretical. We see the practical, the real, the very people who are impacted by this work in specific time and place and location. Cornelius, his family, his servants, and the soldier who had delivered the word of God. It was all the working of God that the Spirit came to them, that Peter also received visions to equip him to declare this message, that Peter delivered the word to Caesarea, that they might hear it. It is all the gracious working of God through this hero of the faith. That's where we will stop reading together today. I hope you found the study of the word edifying. If you'd like to do some more additional reading, pick up in the next chapter, in chapter 11, and go ahead and read verses 1 through 18, as you see how other Christians react when they hear about what Peter has done. Think about how that section relates to what we read together in chapter 10 today. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, you are at work in our midst to bring about your will. Today, we read about your work in the life of Cornelius and in those around him through your servant, Peter. Help us to always hear your word, remembering that what you declare is true. Help us to remember our baptism as we are your children. 
and as your children, equip us, as you equipped Peter, to speak your word to those in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.